If it's your kid asking, it's annoying. If it's a billion people across the globe, it's a challenge and responsibility. Farmers feeding the world. It's about agriculture coming together to increase both hunger solutions and food production. Please learn more and give generously. Senator Tammy Baldwin, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Now you are a freshman senator, but you are not new to Congress by any means. Right. Uh, how many years did you spend serving in the House? 14 years, seven terms, representing South Central Wisconsin in the House of Representatives. And can you describe how your constituency expanded now as a senator and the types of agriculture you represent? Well, the south central part of the state certainly had a focus on dairy. Mm -hmm. And you could say that also about the entire state of Wisconsin. Uh, but uh, as I now represent the entire state, some of our specialty crops play a more prominent role when you look at the statewide map. And the um, agricultural economy of the north is very different than the uh, agricultural economy of the south um, of the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I, Wisconsin, I learned uh, over many years, is the number one producer of cranberries, as an example of a specialty crop. This time of year, of course, we think about that. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition, uh, we're second only to California in terms of production of organics. Oh, I didn't know that. And uh, if you look at the difference in size and population of the state, that's a pretty impressive statistic. We're also very... Uh, uh, prominent in the production of um, fruits and vegetables for canning and freezing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we produce a lot of potatoes that are used in uh, potato chips and french fries. So it sounds like you have various interests there, but what are some of the biggest concerns you hear from your constituents in agriculture? Well, you know, in our state, uh, agriculture is a pillar of our economy. Uh, about one in ten people in our state are employed either directly or indirectly in the agricultural economy. Mm -hmm. And of that, uh, probably half is focused on dairy. So that makes the dairy policy a really, really key component of any farm bill. And I've been focusing in squarely on that as the farm bill debate has uh, unfolded over the course of this year. Mm -hmm. um, this bill, uh, in dairy and in other areas, re represents a, a real uh, I think change in terms of policy and programs uh, to allow farmers to manage their risks in new ways. And I think this is going to be a really important breakthrough when we're finally able to pass uh, a bipartisan uh, farm, uh, farm bill deal. Uh, so uh, dairy farmers have been very active in that debate of how we allow them better to um, manage their risk. Right. And uh, you know that that remains, I think, a, a universal issue in agriculture. There's so many things you don't control. You don't control the weather. You don't control the price of your seed right. or your feed if you're uh, taking care of livestock. And you don't often control the price at the other end of the um, of the process. So it's a lot of risk to manage. Um, some people who have been involved in the farm bill process for a few years have said that this process is a little different than previously. Is that true, and why do you think that is? Well, I think because this uh, farm bill appears as though it's going to uh, represent a real pivot from decades-old policies. Mm -hmm. And I think the second reason I would say this process has been different uh, is the real volatile debate that occurred in the House of Representatives where uh, for the first time in memory, recent memory, uh, the House tried to separate nutrition policy from agriculture policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of folks watch that almost dumbfounded to say, where do they think this food comes from? Well, it comes from the farmers of America. And there's a reason why these two sets of policies have long been uh, part of the same measure. Now, I'm glad that's where we're going to end up. But I think both of those uh, issues, the the um, real pivot to a, a new set of approaches, as well as the debate that they had in the House on uh, on farm versus or agriculture versus nutrition, uh, it made this a very different process than years past. 
Can you elaborate a little on why it's important to connect the nutrition programs with the rest of farm policy? Well, first is just the obvious that the food that we use in our nutrition programs is produced by our nation's farmers. And we are, uh, you know, the world's leading agriculture nation. And, uh, you know, it's inexcusable that we should have a country wherever, where anyone goes hungry. Uh, and so uh, I think it makes absolute uh, common sense to have these uh, policies contained in the same bill. I also think it makes political sense, especially in the House of Representatives where you have uh, representatives who are from more urban areas and representatives from more, more rural areas and some that have a mix of suburban. Uh, but it, uh, it, it reminds people, for example, who don't live near a working farm that farm policy matters to the people they serve and vice versa. Uh, so I, I think politically, especially in the House of Representatives, it makes sense to have it um, combined. It's not as quite as important in the Senate where we represent entire states. So we have a mix of, agri uh, of uh, agricultural concerns, but also a mix of urban, suburban, and rural constituencies. Switching gears a little bit to trade, there are some major trade negotiations going on right now, specifically the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What are your thoughts on the process behind the TPP and your overall, um, I guess, readings of what's going on there? Well, I have to say that um, trying to decipher the content of a trade deal when negotiations are ongoing is always pretty complex. These aren't very transparent processes. And it's actually one of the ways in which I'd, I've weighed in on this deal in the past is that um, we really want to know what's being discussed. We like to see some of the drafts, some of the issues that are in contention. Now, certainly some of that information leaks out, but not to the extent that I would like to see to be the strongest advocate that I can be for my state. Um, I also represent a state that has, as already mentioned, uh, a very strong agricultural sector, but also a very strong manufacturing sector. And uh, uh, both of those industries don't fare the same in the typical trade deal. Uh, and we're yet to see whether TPP is going to be the typical trade deal. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm fighting for all of my constituents and the strength of the Wisconsin economy um, as this process unfolds. You also serve on the Budget Committee, mm -hmm. and recently the deal between Representative Paul and, or Representative Ryan, excuse me, and Senator Murray, um, you know, has made a splash. Right. <laughs> um, what do you think that deal represents for Congress, and what's next? Yeah, well, certainly it's far from perfect, but I think it does represent progress. And I think it represents progress both in terms of its policies and in terms of the process. Let me start with the latter. Uh, we've been drifting from one manufactured crisis to the next in this country for so long that people have lost their confidence in government, that people have uh, lost the ability to have some certainty as they plan for their future. Uh, business owners and uh, families would like to know what the future looks like, and Congress has, uh, in its dysfunction, deprived them of that opportunity. So I think it represents progress procedurally in that um, we're going to go back to a regular and more orderly way of doing things, providing additional certainty. Substantively, given the big divide between the Senate passed budget resolution earlier this year and the House passed budget resolution, um, I, I really think that it's a step in the right direction of making sure that we more fairly divide the burden of decreasing our deficit. Uh, I think that the House passed version put that responsibility on the shoulders of those with the very least and the middle income Americans and asked nothing of those who are most prosperous in our nation, especially in terms of looking at our tax code to all the giveaways for, um, for corporations, uh, some that pay very little or no tax at all. That's not fair. We need a balanced approach forward. Uh, uh, the, the Senate passed a budget that was really focused on growing our economy and helping the middle class. And I think this compromise uh, is a step in the direction of strengthening our middle class. 
Okay, Senator. And finally, can you describe a little bit how your strategy or goals have changed since joining the Senate? Well, I represent a whole state now. And so part of the very early uh, challenge and excitement for me was to better understand the economy of our entire state, mm -hmm. not just the region that I'd uh, been born and raised in and represented in the House of, of Representatives. Um, and that's been really exciting, the travels throughout the state of Wisconsin. Uh, it's an incredible state, it's a beautiful state, the resources as well as the work ethic um, make me really proud and it's been um, an incredible first year in the U.S. Senate. Senator Tammy Baldwin, thank you so much. Thank you.